everyone's walking to the stage, just want to say thank you, um, OpenX, and so far the partnership with OpenX and uh, the Application Developers Alliance has been fantastic. Um, and uh, you know, welcome. Be glad to be here. Glad to see all of you. Um, and thanks for making it out and talking about apps with us. So, you know, as we mentioned, we have some of the best folks in the industry here to uh, talk about how you're going to create an app, launch an app, make money from an app. Basically have a successful app. So without further ado, I'll let the panel sort of introduce yourselves and, um, and then we'll just jump right into it. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jarek Vilkevich and uh, I work on uh, Google Search. Uh, my focus area is uh, developers, uh, so this is a great audience. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I realized that we're only 200 meters away from the beach, and uh, just knowing that you guys are going to listen rather than being there, it's, it's, it's really uh, important to me. Hi, uh, I'm Ben Whithelm. Uh, I work at Millennial Media, uh, and Millennial Media has two main divisions. Uh, maybe some, by a show of hands, who's familiar with uh, Millennial? Yeah, okay, not too bad. So uh, as a result of the, uh, our, our recent acquisition of uh, NextAge and JumpTap, um, we have split the company into two pieces. Uh, we have the traditional managed media side of the business where we provide, we marshal demand into in-app advertising. And the new division, uh, which, has, which is where I work, the platform division, uh, builds tools for mobile app developers, including the exposure of an RTB exchange, a uh, connection to over 120 uh, demand side platforms or DSPs, uh, and an emerging tool set for application developers to manage their monetization efforts, both from a user acquisition and from a publishing perspective. And I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Yoni Bensor. I am the head of engineering for our developer outreach program at Quixie. So a little bit of background on myself. I was a software engineer. I primarily worked on Android development, moved towards content acquisition frameworks, and eventually onto search. And uh, primarily what this company does, Quixi, we provide both a search platform for developers to distribute their content, as well as a monetization platform for developers to have a monetization strategy along with their search strategy. Cool. Hello. Does this work? Awesome. Uh, I'm Ryan from Pollen. Uh, if you haven't heard of, us, heard of us before, we give studios early access to platform revenue. So if you publish on uh, the App Store, on the Google Play Store, or on the Amazon App Store, um, we can give you access to the funds you generate through those platforms early and completely free. So come talk to me afterwards if that's something you're interested in. Perfect. And uh, I'm Greg Blackman. I run Publisher Supply. Uh, on our mobile products for OpenX. And if you're not familiar with OpenX, um, we're the first ad exchange. We, uh, we have a, what, what we call in the industry a full stack solution. So this is anything from a, uh, an ad serving solution to a, an ad exchange to uh, an SSP that brings other monetization sources in. And so and we do this across any device. This can be on your desktop, on your mobile devices, even if you have a, uh, uh, you know, a TV connected device, doesn't matter, we're there. So, um, you know, that is, so let's, let's find out about you guys. I want to find out um, who's just starting out. Who is, who is early stages, startup, if you could raise your hand. Love to see it. Okay. Who's already launched an app? Okay, good. And uh, who's on the other side? Who is in a, either a large company, a growth company, you know, wants to learn, learn more from the panel? Amen. Perfect. All right. So what we'll do here is we'll sort of go through the entire, uh, the entire journey of all the way from a creation to collecting a check. All right. And let's start with the creation portion of it. And first question for the panel is, how do you go about the process of creating an app that people actually want to use? So I think there's been a uh, kind of a fundamental shift around what has been the dominant development methodologies, the kind of rapid iteration here. I sometimes characterize app development as having blown ourselves back to the days of packaged software, right? So yes, you want to continue to rapidly iterate. You always want to be improving your game, using analytics to determine what's working and what's not. But 
in you know for if, for for an app developer, pushing your pushing your app out into the store has a very kind of real uh, impact. And if you're losing stars while you're still working out bugs, that will have an impact on the longer term viability of the app. So I think it it requires a kind of a fundamental shift in mindset around. Quality assurance, release engineering, and and you know I think things that for you know the the many of you that raised your hands that are early stage or, or startup companies uh, need to kind of wrap their head around. Anyone else? I mean I think probably the best place to start at the idea phase is something that you struggle with yourself. It's uh, easiest to navigate rather than just trying to you know build something that you think would be useful to somebody. Um, and I think from there, then you actually have a platform decision as to how do you reach the audience of, of people that also have that problem. Um, they may not be using an iPhone or an Android phone. Um, and then, you know, to uh, you know, to the points that Ben made, I think that with mobile, especially, it's it's challenging, as he suggested, to publish something um, that isn't, you know, uh, at, at a high level of quality because reviews stick with you in those stores, and that makes it challenging to, you know, push down the road. So even if you can ship something in mobile web or something that you can you know, make changes a little bit more dynamically, um, you know, it's probably a you know valuable place to start when you're you're thinking about shipping a, your first app. So we have a Google developer advocate on the uh, on the panel. How, can you talk a little bit about how you, as an as a proprietor of an app store, think about that and how you try to support developers from that perspective? Sure. So um, I don't focus on the app store. So my focus area is Google Search. Uh, I do have a couple of thoughts that I wanted to share uh, with respect to uh, creation uh, process. So uh, I find like design is very important, uh, and I think that's something that is. Uh, frequently overlooked. Uh, being in LA, there's a lot of beautiful things that are made here. Uh, so I think you guys are at a terrific advantage. Um, and another thing that comes to mind is, um, and this is how you know things are a little different from the web, is I find that uh, there are things that you can actually design up front in your app, and you can think about it up front, uh, rather than you know later on and snapping on, on once the app is launched. Uh, so you know my ask uh, for you, as app developers, um, if you're going to remember anything that I say with my weird accent here uh, tonight, uh, think about deep linking. Uh, because I think this is uh, an important technology. Uh, a few you know, developers have heard about it. A lot of people haven't. Uh, but you know, when, you, when you think about the web, uh, imagine the web without URLs and you know, the web without navigation, uh, the, web, the web without orchestration, the web without discovery. Uh, that would be a pretty miserable experience, wouldn't it? Uh, and this is uh, why I think uh, deep linking is something that I think a lot of the people here on the panel will agree uh, is important. Um, hmm. I think there's benefits that uh, you can realize once you think about that. And I know we'll, we'll talk about it a little later. Uh, but I think designing up front for growth, for engagement, and for beauty, uh, I think th those are important things. And for, you know, I, I don't focus on. On, on Google Play, uh, but uh, I do have a few colleagues that really spend a lot of time working with designers and helping with mobile design. And we have great uh, resources at google.com slash design. Uh, and then there's a number of technologies that you can integrate great up front to help you with growth and engagement. And I think we'll, we'll talk about them a little later. Well, it's really, it's a good topic, right? Most of us are interested in acquiring as many users as we possibly can with spending as little money as possible. I feel that that's a very hot topic that everybody wants to know. Deep linking is one of those strategies. It is a, um, a buzzword, as you would say, in the industry. Um, let's touch on that. Let's touch on a few other uh, user acquisition strategies. And so I'll put a very broad blanket statement across. If you had to choose one strategy that would be the most effective strategy as for acquiring users in a non-paid fashion, which channel would you go with? Has to be non-paid, huh? Non-paid. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the so it, it's, it's, it's challenging, right? So, you know, kind of the, the at least for, uh, you know, I can speak to the App Store, less to the Play Market, the, the ability to get featured there, the ability to uh, impact the, uh, the rankings is a bit 
alchemy more than, than science. Um, you know, as, at, at Millennial, again, you know, so we run a performance business specifically devoted to helping application developers get, you know, acquire users and, and, and do that it, for good value, right? So free, again, without, without pay is, is kind of where I'm hung up on this question. Uh, we certainly look at the, uh, the user acquisition strategy as, as something that is critical and that we want to support, but it's, it also means buying media at the end of the day. I think um, perhaps maybe when somebody else on the panel could talk about more grassroots strategies, or, and I know you don't, you're not involved with the play market, but how do you guys think about promotion within the, app store, within the, the play market? I'll get oh, my, let my colleague here speak first. Yeah, so um, a little bit on the strategy of you know, grassroots, uh, a lot of um, moving back towards us SEO, uh, search engine optimization, a lot of techniques that existed on the web that normally would not exist on Android have at least started to shift over. So you know, being able to provide uh, content on the web and linking the web application back to the Android application provides an excellent way to SEO your application. And additionally, for companies like Google, companies like Quixi, as well as a few other companies as well, to uh, index content and to be able to search, with, uh, search over that content in, a, um, in, in an extremely effective strategy. So, in terms of being able to do a grassroots stra uh, a grassroots plan without any mon or without any paid acquisition, uh, SEO is uh, a quite easy method in order to actually uh, accomplish that. But I think Ben alluded to it earlier. The best way to get free users is to get a feature, uh, and I know that's not an easy task. But uh, there's really no question that if you can find a way to you know convince your Apple or you know Google contacts on the editorial team uh, to put you out that, that like that's that's it. that's huge it's absolutely massive i also think that uh, you can look at um, certain um, niches and find uh, networks that exist for that particular niche depending on what your app is. So a really good example of this is I think in the mid-core, hardcore mobile gaming space which is kind of emerging is, is something like Twitch. Uh, World Zombination, uh, which is a game that was published by Proletariat a couple weeks ago uh, which had a great Apple feature. Uh, also built their, built their user base through the beta phase through Twitch and they just did these like Friday um, uh, basically game streaming with the team and they built a really strong core user base um, for that particular game and then that user base became evangelists once the product came out. So it complemented their Apple feature really nicely but I think in, in that particular case Twitch is an enormous audience relatively untapped on mobile and so if it, if it fits you know what you're doing I, I mean that's a, a good spot but finding kind of something that exists or some sort of network that exists that is uh, a little bit more niche but fits your audience is, is you know probably a decent place to start to acquire users for free. I agree. And one of the one of the core things when you're building an app is looking at that evangelist core small group of users that are going to be, you know, in that niche situation that are going to be your biggest fans and help promote, right? So, the next question is, let's say you're looking at a growth strategy, you have, you know, 250, 500,000, 10,000 of these guys. Uh, what would be your strategy to acquire your first 250 biggest fans? Um, so I can probably offer a little bit onto that. Um, primarily, uh, a lot of applications that I've at least personally built have uh, geared towards particular markets. So for example, uh, applications that are geared towards college students, for, uh, for instance. Being able to reach out to that particular niche market is being, or being able to discover some strategy to hit that particular market uh, is key. So for instance, as in just an example, reaching out to, um, to people that are already in college, being able to uh, supply that application for free, let them use it, and get them interested in the product, and you know, alluding back to, the, to, to offering good features and being able to supply that, um, was able, uh, allowed at least for, for my applications to uh, get that initial growth. And that eventually leaded to, or led to um, being able to uh, publish, um, sorry, uh, to publish all of these, uh, essentially free users on social media. So being able for them to spread my application on social media was key. 
I think the, the, other, the other critical piece is that you measure it, right? So uh, if you're familiar with the net promoter score, uh, measure of uh, inherent virality of your, of, your, of your app or organic virality, um, making sure that that's being measured, making sure that you're giving those power users, those, those, prom those promoters, uh, either access, easy access to the social graph to share and, and or, or, you know, integrated with uh, uh, address books, like just make it, make it frictionless for somebody to share it so that when you do find those promoters, they have an easy way to get the word out. You could probably just hang out outside Starbucks and buy someone a coffee, coffee to download your app and the CPI is probably lower than <laughs> Uh, buying media right now, so I'll take I exception that with that. Coffee, <laughs> in, coffee here in Los Angeles is pretty expensive. Okay, four, yeah, a four dollar yeah. yeah. and seventy five cent latte versus a, coffee. Uh, well, then let's, just, getting, let's say it's Ralph's. Yeah, then we're getting let's close. Just coffee, coffee at Ralph's. Yeah, but I mean, if you want two hundred and fifty people, that you could do that, and it wouldn't be too expensive. Right. Just throwing it out there. Can I? Can I try it? Real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, with respect to organic uh, acquisition, so we started. Um, helping in that regard uh, about a year ago. Uh, so we have a feature called uh, Apps Universal where uh, we will actually surface apps in search results and offer a Play Store uh, referral link so users can click uh, and install the app. And I think uh, another thing that I know we're going to get into that I wanted to make sure uh, we do cover is uh, engagement. Uh, because I think everybody's very focused on you know, driving the installs. And the truth is actually a lot of the apps are installed and never used. Like, uh, you know, Raise your hand if you use all the apps that you have installed. Like personally, you know, okay, so we have one very cell here. Uh, but a lot of people install apps and like I'm a forgetful person, I forget I, I even had it. Uh, so another area where we're trying to help, um, and again, this is more in the organic growth category, is the engagement. So how do you actually get people to come back into your app uh, in a way that isn't annoying, that is not gonna make them uninstall it, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's related to, to a clear user intent. And again, this is where uh, deep linking technology uh, can help you. So our particular implementation is called app indexing, uh, and there are others. There's a number of standards in the area. Uh, but I think uh, once you have the app installed, thinking about engagement is another thing that uh, I think a lot of people forget because uh, driving installs is you know, such a big, big deal. Yep, and it's a tough business. So um, talked about, you know, we talked about um, you know, a number of different user acquisition. I really want to know about this deep linking, right? So it's a hot topic. Somebody want to explain to the audience what deep linking is and why it's important? Um, yeah, so essentially what deep linking provides is the ability to take uh, users directly to the parts of the application that are normally not accessible. So for instance, Yelp can uh, create their application in a way that is deep linkable to take their users directly to the restaurant state of the application rather than simply requiring them to go to the home page. And the key why this is actually uh, an important strategy to put into your application is that it takes users directly to where they need to be. And that's key. So when it comes to retention, when it comes to user engagement, being able to take direct users directly to what they're looking for means that they don't need to spend the time uh, to go through multiple parts of the application and to potentially fall through the funnel and would never get to that part that they actually need. So, I mean, I guess if that's they Google uh, that, I, very good. <laughs> Yeah, and, and one thing that I, I wanted to mention is, so again, uh, this is a bit of a product pitch, but uh, so right now on Android, 15% uh, of, of uh, search results for sign-in users uh, contain deep links. Uh, so if you, your application supports deep linking, there's a very good, uh, good chance that you know, if a user searches for something, uh, when they see the blue link, when they click, it actually is go a search is gonna launch your app rather than you know, take them uh, to a website. And this is something that a lot of app developers want. Uh, and what's necessary for that is uh, for Google Search to know that there is actually a deep link correspond corresponding to you know the, the search result, and then that the content um, uh, that the app presents uh, when uh, we send them to that deep link is actually matching what uh, uh, the user was searching for in the first place. So there's like a very clear uh, you know value prop, uh, and it's it's basically organic, so you don't have to pay for this. And, and it works for different kinds of media as well. Search is obviously a very uh, kind of clear use case, but you know you can run traditional display media in app on the mobile web and still and either as a re-engagement campaign uh, or as a, an opportunity to drive somebody if you have offer in-app purchases in uh, in your app some, to drive somebody back to the store. If you know if you've got some data on this user, you know that they're. Uh, 
a purchaser of, uh, of items within your app, you can take them back to the store, reduce the friction, and do that through a traditional display ad, not only through search. I, I guess I kind of think of it in two ways. The, the first one is indexing your content, and, and, and that allows it to, to be discovered better. But I guess I also think about it from the perspective of complementary services. So if you can um, embed some sort of, you know, if you're building an app that lets you buy movie tickets, if you can embed uh, a, a link that allows um, someone to open up uh, Uber, uh, for example, um, so that once they've bought the ticket, they can then go and, you, once you've bought the ticket, you can then go and, and order an Uber to get to the, the theater. Or some sort of like complementary services when you, you have a recipe app and you can then go and buy the grocery item and link directly into the, the grocery. So I guess there's kind of the indexing side, but also if I'm, if I'm building an app now, uh, I also want to add value, you know, add as much value as possible for the user, and that may not all come from your app, but you can plug into complementary services to, to add more value. Yeah, so um, again, uh, to, to add on to that, you know, it's, it's important to stay with the core competency of what your application actually does. So in the case of, of Fandango, for instance, if they're selling movie tickets and then would offer the service of being able to take the user directly to the movie theater that they're looking for, it's important to not spend the time to actually build that out and to focus on the core competency of what your application does, which is selling of movie tickets. Being able to outsource that functionality to other applications really helps move your application along more quickly because you can spend your time on your app. And then, app mashups. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, there's uh, one other thing that I wanted to comment on, which was um, not only being able to provide uh, interconnect interconnectivity between applications as well as indexing, uh, but additionally being able to provide features within your application. So uh, for instance, bookmarking, providing nice back button capabilities on Android specifically, as well as being able to provide share functionality is really easy with deep linking. Perfect. So now we have a specific user coming to a specific portion of an app for a specific purpose. I guess my so last question here, because we only have about five minutes left, which is um, what's your strategy for segmentation of the audience and what can you do with that information? So uh, you're starting to see the, uh, you know, the app analytics space become uh, rather fragmented and, and crowded. I think for a, while, for a long time, you, uh, if you wanted to use a, a third-party analytics, uh, it was, you could use Flurry or Flurry. Um, and uh, they built a media business on, on the back of, the, uh, of, that, of those analytics. So I think, but back to your original question, there are lots of services out there that will allow you, once you've determined what the, critical, uh, what the critical actions are in your app, whether those are in-app purchases, whether that's a uh, number of uh, recurrences, like that, if you're, how you're being retained in the app, the level of engagement, if you've gotten to level 10. Um, once you've gotten those things, they're, uh, they're relatively easy to bucketize, either with, with kind of pure play enterprise analytics and environments, or those that have media aspirations, like the one that Facebook released uh, yesterday, uh, analytics for apps. Um, but I think kind of getting back to your, ultimately what you want to get to is the lifetime value of your user, right? And whether that's, whether that's through segmentation or whether that's through, and you know, you don't, you'll understand that you'll have premium users and the freeloading users and what, how, being able to separate the monetization capability of the, of the top and the bottom is just something that uh, you absolutely have to attack early on in your, uh, your development process. I have one uh, comment, and this is a bit of a risky prediction, but uh, I was looking at a report uh, from an uh, analyst, uh, this DigiCap DigiCapital, they are out of uh, London, they recently moved to San Francisco. And uh, the latest report was saying that in 2017, uh, most of the App Store revenue are actually going to come from something they call App as a Service, uh, whereas right now, uh, as we all know, the games are kind of the the 100 part gorilla. So I think what's going to happen is, and you know, my previous experience, I used to work for YouTube, and I did a lot of work with the gaming industry. I was always amazed how sophisticated they are when it comes to analytics. <coughs> uh, so they even have the term called uh, game economy, where you know there are people thinking about tweaking, turning knobs, and you know treating different users differently depending on how much they spend, where they are, which level they are, and all that stuff. So I think if I was looking at you know patterns uh, right now, this is an area of of interest to me, I would definitely look into gaming because I think a lot of the best practices and knowledge uh, is going to come from that industry and then it's going to translate into much better monetization opportunities for uh, developers going forward. 
Uh, otherwise, the prediction I just quoted is going to be false. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, on the, especially on the revenue generation side, I think there's a company here, or at least uh, in California, called Performance Revenue, and they do like dynamic pricing for your game. So you know, in-app purchase pricing um, based on segmentation, which I think is was pretty amazing, um, and allow you know allowing you to, to you make those changes and, and change the way that you present that to different users. So um, I, I, I suspect that's that's definitely the case that we'll, we'll see a lot from gaming. I, I also think that uh, gaming has been slow because of the flow to adopt Facebook Connect, but I think you have to make a really good case to not have Facebook Connect as a way to for a user to log into your app now. I mean, because just the insights that you get from it, um, and it's you know it's a pretty slick flow. Uh, so I think from a, a segmentation perspective, if you're you know, if you're building an app, you probably want to have Facebook Connect so that you can find out you know uh, information about the user, uh, and then. Yeah, I think I think that we'll see a lot from from gaming on how we segment users and how we think about which users spend money and which users may never spend money and what the experiences are like for uh, the separate the separate user base because it, it just it it you know as we optimize it won't remain the same uh, you you'll have a very different experience in an app. So I think we have time for one question here and then um, if you have any other additional questions you know we'll hang out in the back. Bye, Joe. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, the, the question that you're asking is that you are providing web deep links and the user clicks on that link and is expected, uh, essentially, what is the behavior that happens when that, that link is clicked, right? So there's actually a few different strategies that you can take with this. Um, what we normally recommend is taking the user to the web application uh, if they don't have the application already installed and to hint towards downloading the application as a better user experience. Some applications that don't have a web experience at all and only provide an Android-based experience or an iOS-based experience, we do recommend to take the user directly to the App Store to install the application. Additionally, for services like Tapstream, if you are implementing that, you can direct the user from the application once they've installed it to open up the, that deep link that they originally clicked on. So essentially, you would, uh, is, what, is what we at least call a deferred deep link. I have a quick, quick comment. So for those of you that have a website and an app, uh, we recently announced that actually if you uh, implement uh, deep linking and app indexing, then uh, that's actually going to be used as one of the ranking signals. Uh, so it benefits you there as well. Perfect. Well, I think we're out of time. And uh, thank, thank you, panel, for, uh, for joining us. We'll be in the back. Visit appalliance.org to access resources and join a global network of developers.